Okay. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, Hello. and welcome to our panel on artificial intelligence for climate control. Um, great having you here. I'm uh, Yanni Valtschuler, and um, I thought that we'll start by uh, a quick uh, round of uh, introduction. Uh, so if you can each um, present yourself, your history, and uh, what you're doing currently on artificial intelligence and or uh, climate uh, change or a few minutes, uh, that would be a great start. So uh, Professor Alex Lipton, why don't we start with you? Okay. Uh, good evening, everybody, or good morning for those um, who are on the other part of the globe. Um, my name is Alex Lipton. I will not tell you the whole story of my life because it's long and I have been doing many things in different areas, uh, but um, I'm a trained mathematician and uh, I worked, um, I, I taught at the University of Illinois, I was a full professor there, and then I also worked for the U.S. government as a consultant at Los Alamos, and then for about 25 years I worked for various investment banks and hedge funds, and then I founded uh, my own company, and then uh, in January of this year I joined uh, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authority as a global head of research and development in the strategy and planning department. And I'm also a fellow at MIT with Yaniv and also a professor at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem, where I teach financial engineering and blockchain. That's okay. me. A very concise uh, uh, summary. Speaking of blockchain, I highly recommend uh, anyone to read um, Alex's uh, recent book on uh, blockchain and distributed ledgers which is a true masterpiece um, and I uh, have read it and highly <laughs> recommend everyone to do so. Um, Dr. Julia Oliver, uh, why don't we right. continue with you? Okay, so hi everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm Nuria Oliver, I am a computer scientist. Uh, I have a PhD in artificial intelligence from MIT and my main area of uh, research is the use of artificial intelligence for social good, which I've been doing since the mid-90s. Um, I've been a researcher at Microsoft Research, and I have held director of research positions in large companies. I was the first um, female research director at Telefonica, where I created the area of um, AI and, and, and data science, uh, and especially also the area of AI and data science for social good. I was also, I've also been director of research globally at Vodafone, a research in data science, and I also created the area of using AI for social good. I'm a data scientist if I'm in an NGO called Data Pop Alliance, which is devoted to the use of the AI and data for social good. And I have just um, very recently uh, co-founded and I'm the director of a nonprofit foundation uh, called the Institute of Humanity-Centric AI which is part of the ELIS uh, Network of Scientific Excellence. ELIS means the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligent Systems, and it's a network of excellence that we've created in Europe, uh, connecting the best uh, uh, scientists working on machine learning and related topics. There are 34 different ELIS units in 14 different countries in Israel, and the only ELIS unit in Spain is the one that I've created in Alicante, which is devoted to human-centric AI, and that's why it has this name. And I'm excited to be in this panel, and I thank uh, Yanni for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Nuria. Um, we'll talk about uh, the work in Elisa Alicante uh, later on. I want to ask you about it. Uh, but let's continue uh, first with the uh, U-Shields. Um, yes, hello. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I have recently founded a think tank on AI. My think tank is called the Center for Research into AI and Mankind. Uh, I think our goals are very, very similar to what have just been described. Our mission is really to think about how we optimize the interaction of human and machines when we get to the technological singularity. That's, our, that's what we're trying to do. Um, 
the fellows in, in this think tank are some of the best people in the AI field. I've been uh, actually working for Huawei for the last five years. I've recently left Huawei. Um, but some of the people I, I have in, in the think tank are the top people in AI who used to work at Huawei. Um, a little bit picking up on some of the earlier uh, comments, my background is quite varied. I worked in investment banking for 12 years. I started out life as an accountant. Um, I was technical director at the International Accounting Standards Board, which makes international uh, financial reporting standards for the world apart from America. And most importantly, I am a magician. This is most important. <laughs> Uh, I also have written eight books, and they're on a whole range of subjects, uh, including a Einstein, some about running, some about music, different for different. Uh, so, I'm looking forward to this, and very happy to be on the on the panel. Thank you. First question: Can magic help us uh, curb uh, climate warning? <laughs> magic, magic I think it's our only help. hope. Magic can always help everyone. <laughs> it may be the only solution that we have at this point. <laughs> we need a little bit of magic for climate change. Yeah, we do. A little bit of, ma of magic can never hurt. Never hurt. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Um, so, uh, Catherine. Uh, let's uh, hear from you. I know that you've been doing some uh, fascinating work on this topic. So why don't you tell us all about it? Oh, you're on mute. In the middle, you have a microphone. P push it. Let's try now. No. Or in your computer, go to the volume and, and, and increase the volume in your computer, maybe. I'm trying to be nice, that's all. <laughs> okay. So maybe we'll uh, give you a couple of minutes to try and um, solve this issue and uh, proceed to uh, Amir. Yes, hi. Okay. I, I'm not trying to, to tease. I just say I'm not a professor, I'm not a doctor. I have only high school degree. And, uh, and I'm learning every day. So I always do it with people. Somebody called me human AI, but it's okay. I'm, I'm smiling. Um, I'm here because I know Frank from Horasis about, about 2000, 2010. And uh, I'm leading uh, today, I'm leading a group of AI group that was building a company in AI and electricity. First time in the world that uh, we're managing uh, utility of electricity. Actually, Mitsui and uh, invested in this. Uh, I built two years ago again because of COVID-19 AI company in water called Evolution Water, which, which the government of Israel invested in this company and is the first client. So, first time in the world, I'm using AI to manage infrastructure and reduce AI uh, reduce the cost of energy. Uh, last week, I signed a deal of, with doctors from Hong Kong to use AI to analyze. Uh, uh, replace cardiologist uh, monitoring the heart by giving brain to the stupid devices. They're checking the doc doctor doing everything. They're checking it, then you sit on the with, the with the pictures and try to analyze. But I think that AI can do it automatically. So what I'm seeking because my weakness is my strength. I look about things and see them like my son see things I, I see and says, hey, it can be done differently. And it's always done with people. So I'm an international entrepreneur. My expertise creates value and innovation. Uh, I'm learning every day, and it's exciting, actually. And I'm happy to share what I'm learning over here in the last two years in, in this event. Actually, last week I was in London in a water conference, and I said in the panel, closing panel, guys, I don't understand nothing in water. I am serious. I just understand the management. So I hope to contribute from my angle. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Catherine, uh, were you able to... Still, maybe don't, maybe still don't use the, the headphone, or maybe move, move to the change the microphone. Maybe, maybe you can uh, disconnect and reconnect. Uh, so maybe I'll uh, take take the time to uh, uh, present uh, uh, myself. Um, I'm uh, Yanni Valtrier. My uh, PhD and background is in computer science and artificial intelligence. Um, I spent several weeks, several years at MIT um, doing my uh, postdoc research, and um, I'm still a researcher at MIT focused on um, decentralized AI. 
swarms, complex systems, uh, and so on. Uh, I've published um, several books and uh, several dozen papers on this topic. I had the pleasure of working both with Alex Lipton here as well as with Nuria uh, and hope to continue publishing more together with you and with the rest of the participants in the panel I have not published with uh, yet. Um, and <laughs> while we hope, while we wait for, for Catherine to rejoin us, maybe we'll continue with the first uh, question. This is a general question I wanted to ask uh, each of you. Um, let's start with you, Nuria. How can breakthrough... Oh, here is Catherine again. Let's see. Catherine, can we hear you? Uh We'll try this one more time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Just in time. <laughs> okay. Great. So, Catherine. It's always yeah. um, the last glitch on a Friday evening. So, yes. Thank you. And sorry for that. I tried to um, participate in the check-in beforehand, but there was the very dynamic discussions happening. So, my name is Catherine Foster. I am coming from you uh, to you from. Um, uh, Fribourg in Switzerland, but I'm actually a former Canadian diplomat on climate and human security, and I'm a geographer by training. And I did that because it was the only subject where I could do the sciences, uh, humanities and economics. And then uh, once the initial stages of geographic information systems came along, I was able to embark on that. But at that stage in the um, early 90s, uh, we were still digitizing things by hand. So we've come a long way. I've held some um, leadership roles in the EU's EIT Climate Kick, which is the largest innovation um, initiative um, on climate innovation. And uh, I was there for four years, uh, including on, um, as the business and innovation lead across one of the pillars. And then I moved to Washington DC for four years. I've been working with the Green Digital Finance Alliance, which was set up by UNEP and Ant Financial which has the biggest you know, um, integrated technology, uh, climate, uh, behavioral app around. Um, served as Sherpa to the UN Secretary General's Task Force on uh, Digital Financing. Um, I've worked with startups and World Bank and the UN, um, including the, the Task Force on Big Tech Impacts on Sustainable Development in Developing Countries. And I'm the lead author of those uh, extended dialogue tech papers as well as on a number of um, uh, chapters on blockchain and emerging tech. I also serve on the supervisory board of the EIT Food, the EU Blockchain Observatory, and the European Securities and Market Authority uh, Financial Innovation um, Working Group. And I'm working with the Open Earth Foundation and Social Alpha Foundation um, and the Digital Economist, and basically trying to take that legacy knowledge of the the gaps and the silos and the fragmented solution space that I saw as a policy expert, as well as in the innovation space, uh, including the early days of certification on everything from conflict diamonds to uh, the global reporting index and seeing the capacities of blockchain, emerging tech, AI, et cetera, to actually start uh, filling those gaps. So I've actually built out a number of, with uh, groups, um, help to build out a number of concrete solutions as well. So very happy to be here and to look forward to a great discussion. Thank you, Catherine. So as I was saying, um, I thought that uh, it would probably be best to start with um, the first question that um, each of you uh, would answer uh, by turn, uh, starting with you, Nuria. Uh, how can breakthroughs in AI play a key role in curbing climate change. This is uh, the topic of our panel. So let's start with a general question. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the intersection between AI and climate change is uh, very big. And in fact, I would dare to say that we want to be able to curve climate change without the help of AI, which of course is not the solution, but it is, and it has to be part of the solution. So data-driven methods, which are the dominant methods in um, AI today, and particularly deep neural network-based methods, um, are un un underneath the best uh, climate and weather prediction systems today, and also modeling systems that enable us to identify patterns, to 
uh, make predictions on global temperature, for example, and also to um, detect, you know, anomalies very quickly. Um, we can also use um, AI methods to improve a state of the art weather modeling systems, for example, to have more accurate noise detection and separation of noise versus the signal in climate observations, which is one of the big challenges, or even doing the automatic labeling of uh, weather and climate data, which is also another big challenge. We know that one of the consequences of climate change is the, uh, the in, uh, increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events like natural disasters uh, based on weather like hurricanes, intense storms or floodings. And we can actually build accurate predictions of these uh, intense weather events using data driven um, uh, machine learning models. And there are examples of predicting heavy rain and hail and forest fires and earthquakes using uh, data driven machine learning methods. We can also use AI to give uh, a better response when um, a disaster happens, uh, both in terms of, for example, using um, drones that are guided with AI to um, uh, put out fires or to search for survivors of natural disasters, but also to use um, AI to analyze um, 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 multidimensional sort of like sources of data to do an early detection of potential humanitarian crisis or uh, disasters. And one example of this is the, is the uh, project called Artificial Intelligence uh, for Disaster Response from the QCRI in Qatar. Of course, we cannot have um, renewable energies that are efficient like solar energy or wind energy without good prediction models of the weather because they depend on the weather and also with good predictions of the demand and none of these predictions can be made if it's not using you know data driven ai methods so i don't think we can have renewable uh, um, efficient and uh, renewable energy systems that are efficient without that we are also not able to have a smart grid without ai because it wouldn't be a smart if it didn't rely on ai but even beyond the, the direct application of artificial intelligence on on uh, weather, um, there, also, there is also studies that show that if we were to apply AI methods to industries or sectors that are very uh, greenhouse emissions heavy, we could actually also have a positive impact on the climate. And in fact, there is a study uh, that uh, Microsoft commissioned to PwC on the use of AI on um, industries that actually cause a lot of greenhouse emissions right now. And they found that um, they could um, 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 sort of like reduce the emissions by 4% by 2030, which is the equivalent of the emissions from several countries in the world, like Japan and Canada and Australia combined. And there are many initiatives right now uh, at the intersection between AI and climate change, like large initiatives, uh, for example, uh, in Europe, but also in the private sector. Most of the large technology companies have some kind of initiative um, uh, to build more accurate weather systems or, you know, natural disaster prediction systems and so forth. But not everything is positive. Unfortunately, artificial intelligence also contributes negatively to climate change because it's actually a big contributor to greenhouse emissions, fundamentally because of three um, major reasons. First of all, because current data-driven methods are very data-driven. They need very large-scale data to learn from, and the data centers uh, and the data infrastructures where this, where this data needs to be hosted, they are very energy uh, greedy. So that's uh, one big factor. In fact, uh, a, a report from the European Commission estimates a 28% growth in the energy consumption of data centers in Europe between 2018 to 2030. Uh, so that's one contribution, negative contribution. The second one is because these very complex, highly dimensional, deep neural networks require a lot of energy to learn, to be trained. And you know, there are some studies that have shown that even just training a state-of-the-art language model to do natural language processing would, you know, would um, uh, produce the same CO2 as uh, the amount of CO2 that the average American produces in two years. So it's a really uh, big contributor to CO2 emissions. 
And finally, even once you have trained the models, you have to run these models and actually running these models um, uh, and deploying them in the large scale also consumes energy that that needs to be taken into consideration. And that's why there is a lot of research right now on how to uh, invent and how to develop more energy efficient, less data greedy machine learning methods that are able to perform as well as the current ones, but being much more sustainable and respectful to uh, the environment and therefore contributing less to uh, climate change. Wow. Thank you, Nuria. Um, very comprehensive and insightful uh, review. I have to say that there are two topics I was personally, I found um, very appealing to the works that I'm doing. Um, you talked about the use of AI uh, for detecting uh, survivors of forest fires uh, and natural disasters. And I myself have actually written an entire book on this topic, the, the design of optimal uh, swarms of drones that use decentralized AI uh, for this. And actually in my upcoming book, there is um, also a chapter touching exactly on this topic. So this is something that's really close to my heart. The second thing that I found um, fascinating is um, uh, the part that you were discussing uh, the cost of AI. And um, over the past couple of years, I've been um, uh, advising the Israeli government uh, on AI in general, um, acting as the strategic advisor for the Ministry of uh, Defense here in Israel. And one of the things that we've um, studied was uh, exactly this. Um, should we do this brute force, crazy doomsday systems that analyze everything? Of course not. This is not scalable and it costs a lot, both in energy and resources and so on. And um, the answer is that actually in different architectures, federated learning, lean, on-demand, ad hoc, agile um, architecture that can um, direct the resources exactly to what's needed. So yeah, um, I completely agree. Uh, fascinating. Uh, you, Nuria was talking about weather and natural disasters. And I know that these are some of the topics that are uh, very close to your uh, line of work. Mm -hmm. So why don't you take us through the way you see AI and how it can um, uh, affect uh, climate change and our abilities to delay it? Yeah. Sure. I think, um, actually, let me just start by saying, I didn't say this in my intro, and I probably ought to have done. Um, my degree was in econometrics at Cambridge, and I was very much, I didn't realize at the time, but this is a great basis for thinking about big data and, and the whole world of AI we now find ourselves in. Um, I My views on AI and, and climate control are, uh, I, I think, it's, it's a little bit hanging in the balance. Uh, I, I should say that I do agree with everything that Noria said. I think AI can make a tremendous contribution. Uh, I, I think, I, as I say, I, I think everything Noria said is, is, is spot on. Um, there is uh, clearly an aspect of AI which enables us to improve our forecasting ability. And there is so much work out there which shows that AI compared to humans with that much better at doing forecasting. That's great. Um, modeling weather and modeling climate, however, is extremely difficult. There are so many variables. Uh, on any given day, uh, I have a, a good friend of mine, actually, who, who was a uh, technical lead at Shell for many years on, uh, on aviation, actually on the use of aviation for fuel. Um, you're looking at different areas of the different layers of the stratosphere, it's basically impossible to model, uh, according to him. There are just too many complex things going on. My view is very much don't let the best be the enemy of the good. We ought to accept uh, that AI is uh, giving us greater functionality than humans. It can give us better functionality to forecast and therefore, let's embrace it. And let's say, yes, we get a better answer. Do we get a perfect answer? No, I don't think so. It's, there's too much complexity there. Um, but the forecasting functionality of AI is, is clearly so way superior to humans that it must have a very positive contribution 
if we just think about forecasting. Uh, there is another aspect of AI and climate control, which I think is very interesting. And um, Mark Cockleberg, I expect, is known to, to many of you. Um, and there's a very good, the, the MIT series on different things, but this is particularly on AI ethics that Mark Cockleberg has written. He says, yeah, there's another aspect to AI and climate. And that is that AI is powering the likes of Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and these characters to go to Mars. Well, that is actually detracting from sustainability on planet Earth and, and improving uh, our ability to uh, uh, manage climate change. And in that sense, you could say, well, AI is actually a negative distraction. It might not help us because it's, it's dragging away. You know, these guys, they want to go to Mars. Um, I don't want to go to Mars. I'm not sure I want to live on Mars. I'm not sure there's much to do on Mars. And while they devote resources and AI resources to those trips to Mars, they detract from what we can do on planet Earth. So what is the contribution of AI to climate uh, control? It's, to me, it's hanging in the balance. Forecasting, great. This, this resource effort to going to Mars, in my view, not so great. So that's, that's where I stand. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. It's an interesting view. Um, well, I mean, this is very reminiscent of this recent movie, Don't Look Up, right? I don't know if you've seen it, but this is exactly what the movie is about. You know, uh, people are not believing in climate change. And um, and then in parallel, you know, the multi-billionaires of the world, you know, have a plan B of like, you know, abandoning yes. planet Earth as soon as things get bad, right? Exactly. Can, I, can, I, can, I take, can I take you to, to, to a specific area of infrastructure they I, if you would like me to energy efficiency, because I want to share my view about energy efficiency, because I think it's very, very important to, to the climate. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Look, climate change, uh, I come from a different angle of view, is the daily work of, of AI and use it. I'm not, uh, as I said, I said I'm what I'm not, but I said what I'm doing. Building a first time ever in, 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 in the world, the company with the government of Israel, that doing AI, that analyzing the, the all water system of Israel, and by, by doing so, reducing about 15% of the energy cost of the Israeli water company means that if I will succeed to do it in the next coming months, I reduce the energy cost of Israel by 2%. Which means if I do so, I reduce the cost of climate because energy and climate is very, very connected. So what I'm doing and what we are focusing is is reducing the cost of energy in infrastructure. We're doing this in the water, we're doing now in electricity, by next target is going to refineries. Any area that you have a huge consumption of energy, AI can just, with better management, reduce the cost of energy. Because the reservoir are much lower, the, the prediction allows better. We, by using AI, I don't have to replace all the system and all the pipelines and everything because AI can learn what this pump is doing and with, when, when the maintenance will be done and what size of the lake and what they need in the consumption, what the weather. AI can see everything and can give better management. So I'm focusing, and that's why I'm saying, in, in energy efficiency by using AI in infrastructure, many kind of infrastructure. Now, this is kind of a phone to smartphone. Remember, connecting computers and phones. It wasn't over there about 20 years ago. And suddenly, I was in the water conference in London last week, and nobody was talking about. People said about data, how people keep the data and, and not share the data because data is, is power, how people doesn't want to open the data, the, the utilities, or the utilities doesn't want to save because they're only green. So I think that AI can give us pattern. AI can, can help us deal with the pains of, the points of pain. Like the body is, is, a, is a like, a, you know, you have the blood, the, the blood system. But the moment you don't deal with all the AI, all the country, you deal with the pain, the points that we use energy too much. We don't, we don't consume the energy well. We, we're putting our resources in places we're not needed. AI see everything. By the way, even AI can see the patterns in, in, in renewable energy. Even in renewable energy, you have patterns. In the disorder, you have order. That's what I'm trying to say. So we, what we do is managing infrastructure using AI. Now I give you another angle why so AI is so important today. And I'm not talking about politics, but look what's happening now in Ukraine. You have a lack of resources. So when you have lack of resources, you need better management. The price is going up. 
Everybody talking about Third World War, yes or no, doesn't matter in, in this kind of a way. But you, you have a lack of energy. So AI can give you immediate tool to better energy efficiency. Immediate. It's not, I don't have to build new pipes. I don't have to do, I've, AI allows me to manage myself better as a country, as a nation, as a utility. So I'm seeing that AI is a tool by managing better the infrastructure, then managing better the climate, because the infrastructure affects very strongly on the climate. And, as, and we consume a lot of energy. Earth doesn't have enough energy to what we need. For example, data centers will consume about 25% in the, in the energy. So the world is going to place more, give me more food, give me more energy, but the world doesn't have more, enough energy. So AI can manage the demand, the needs, the, 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 the sequence, who, who in the night, who in the day. For example, you have, you know, just an example, you have electric cars. So in the night, you can take the, the electricity from, from, the, from the batteries and give it to the building that, that, they, that they are living, and in the morning, give back the electricity. AI can manage resources. By the way, we're doing so. I, it's not imagination. There is a project in Nevada, but we're doing so. So the point for you is very, very short. AI is a big brain. AI sees something that human cannot see. And if you, if you design it, and if you know how to manage this, and I'm not an AI person, I say you again, I'm a manager. I see innovation, then it's to give you a great tool like Excel, like PowerPoint in, in your computer to manage yourself better. And this is the beauty of AI, something very immediate. You don't have to develop, I don't have now to replace all the gas fields of, of a country. I just have to see what I have and give the AI the restrictions, the demand, the reservoirs, and the AI will see the patterns and what I should, I should do. And that's my, my angle. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. Um, I actually completely agree. Alex, um, yeah, your turn. AI, okay. climate. Well, after what has been already said, it's hard to add something, but I will take a financial angle because that's what I'm doing. And in my mind, uh, for example, um, carbon um, uh, trading schemas are, have great promise. In general, I think that uh, imposing reasonable price on carbon emissions um, can really change uh, the overall um, composition of the energy producing industries. And so from that perspective, it is very important um, to make sure that these credits are fairly assigned so that, for example, if there is an instance of forestation, then it is uh, really you know, a forested area and it's not cut in the next year and so on and so forth. And so from that perspective, uh, using aerial photography combined with, uh, and of course, satellite photography combined with, uh, you know, processing of um, images can be of great help as well as, uh, in my mind, it would be very good to have an omni- um, well, a, a sufficiently big, um, you know, framework for comparing and assigning coefficients for different activities uh, which uh, are aimed uh, towards decarbonization and, uh, for example, sequestration of carbon, uh, you know, and some other schemas. And so comparing them is very, very hard and uh, requires a lot of, uh, you know, kind of guesswork. But I think that artificial intelligence can take uh, guesswork out of the picture, or at least, you know, reduce the number of assumptions necessary to be equitable in this regard. And then, of course, using blockchain, which is another P for, for that project, which I'm, uh, uh, you know, working on, um, it can really help uh, in avoiding double spend and things like that. And that's at the meta level, at, uh, at the macro level. At the micro level, I can envision, you know, applying artificial intelligence for the purposes of reducing uh, methane and uh, uh, carbon emissions in different industrial processes. I know that uh, Dr. Altshuler is excelling in, uh, you know, putting this idea to practice in agriculture. But there are many areas where it can be used. Uh, for example, production of concrete, I know, uh, is associated with enormous carbon emissions and can be improved if, um, you know, new technological 
uh, approaches are put uh, into production. And so, in other words, I see application at the macro level, I see application at the micro level, and I see application uh, in between as well. So that's my take. Yeah, you actually touched on a, a fascinating topic, which is comparison between completely different origins of uh, greenhouse gases, as well as completely different types of mitigating um, carbon emission, and how can this comparison be done? And uh, since it's now Catherine's turn, I think it's actually a very good uh, sequence because, Catherine, you have been doing quite significant amount of work exactly, uh, well, maybe not exactly on this topic, but uh, for sure on very related topics. So uh, I'm sure that um, you will be able to share uh, a lot of information with us uh, about these topics. Thank you. Um, and yeah, it's a perfect segue, but I, I also want to address some of them at, at different levels as well, some of the issues that have been raised and even the title of this control, climate control, um, you know, what is it we're trying to control? I think that has gotten us into trouble before. So the idea itself is something that we always have to challenge, right? Um, and to me, uh, the way that we've gotten into this mess um, and having been a part of that for 35 years, trying to clean it up through policy and as well as innovation solutions and having those innovation solutions happen in different sectors and in these silos, that is a big problem that AI is now starting to address. So the physical, digital and data divides that we've had, uh, the homogeneous tech and innovation culture that has built out um, isolated, uh, siloed, um, innovations, uh, including ecosystem stakeholders, and even in uh, sort of um, weather modeling. You know, back in the day when we were doing weather modeling, it was it was all human brains and maps and charts and satellite data. But what's interesting now is there's a new la layer as well of indigenous knowledge of also uh, the, the responsiveness to that modeling and to uh, emergency situations where we need to address also uh, localized culture and communities and uh, barriers to actually be able to enact things. So again, we're seeing AI come into bridging the gap between this very high um, technical capacity and a legacy infrastructures and challenges that have existed and, and even been perpetuated by the technological approach. Um, that's very esoteric, but I, I have actually seen this very much in, in case in policy and in solutions. And in policy uh, and in climate markets, this is actually something that we're try I'm trying to do with one of the organizations I'm working with. Um, so when we're looking at carbon markets, for example, and the voluntary market in the Paris Agreement, we have different layers, we have different actors, and we have different ways that that data is being produced into uh, climate markets. So right now there's over 160, it's a very fragmented space. There's no um, capacity, there's no guides around uh, standardization of data, um, and under the Paris Agreement, we have to do a global stock take at the national level in starting this year, how is that going to happen, right? This is this is the big challenge we're facing. How can we measure our progress, and how can we leverage all this monitoring, reporting, and verification capacity that is starting to happen on the ground? So this is where Nest Climate Accounting is actually coming in. That lack of <coughs> transparency, lack of trust, the lack of um, fungibility, the lack of, um, of systemic fit between data sets and the carbon markets themselves <coughs> is a very big problem. So what we're working on is um, solving for that scale. So the global stock take takes place at the global country, state, city, company, individual level. And we can actually get to that point where we're doing that in real time. We have transparent information and open standards that are needed to support that seamless trading of carbon credits across the world. We're not there yet, but that's the solution we're trying to build. And so that the stakeholders can calculate and understand and respond to the cost of carbon in everything we produce and, and consume. And I think right now it is quite fragmented, but there are ways that we're doing this. So one is through the nested climate accounting framework that we're building out at Open Earth Foundation in 
conjunction with that, we're working with the UNFCCC Innovation Hub to build out a platform of solution and need-driven demand um, using AI to crawl and to ad identify not only uh, matchmaking, but actual mm -hmm. gaps. Um, and then we're also doing um, a CAMDA Data 2.0 working group because data is at the core of this. Uh, we need real, we need real data, um, standardized data, and the capacity to actually um, use that data to uh, to these these um, use cases. And the development of that is going to take time. But in the interim, as you say, as we're identifying these gaps, this is where we can start building upon layer after layer of the capacities that we have in place. Yeah, I think that. Um... Uh, well, first of all, very impressive and, and good luck on all of these uh, activities and I'm sure uh, all of us would uh, love to help. Uh, but it seems also related to um, uh, Nuria, to, to some of the work that you have been doing when uh, COVID uh, just uh, started. I remember that uh, we spoke on the first, very first few weeks of COVID that everybody were locked down and we were trying to use big data. We, we have been doing this at Massachusetts with MIT data and you told me that you are doing uh, this, this, this amazing work with the, the Valencian government using big data to predict COVID. Can you briefly take us through this work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, COVID seems so far away now that we are with a war, you know, it seems that we do one thing, one thing after the next. Um, yeah, so in March of 2020, um, I reached out to the presidency of the uh, Valencian government, which is, Spain is a federal state and it's divided in 17, so to say, states. Um, called autonomous regions and the one where i'm located is called the valencian autonomous region uh, i reached out to the presidency with the <coughs> idea of um, creating a group of experts working very closely with the president and the politicians in truly helping them um, in their decision making so their decisions will be evidence driven and sort of like science-based and i got a very positive response uh, they immediately said yes this was early times in the pandemic. So they named me commissioner to the president on data science and AI against COVID-19. And um, I've been leading a team of 20 plus scientists from all the universities and research centers in the region. And we've been working on four areas um, uh, that I will explain briefly uh, next. But um, I think one of the key elements to the success of our team beyond being multidisciplinary is that the politicians were also members of the team. And particularly the director general in public policy, she came to every single meeting and the meetings have been daily for many months. And she's read every single report that I've written, which has been daily for many months. And I think this is absolutely critical and necessary to have this multi-institutional um, also um, experiences because at the end of the day, if the users of, uh, of the results are not involved and they don't make an effort to understand the value and to translate the results into actionable you know, uh, results, um, it doesn't matter how great your research is, you know, it doesn't really have an impact. We've been uh, working on modeling human mobility. We had access to one of the best, I would say, mobility data in the world through the Spanish National Office of Statistics because coincidentally, they had done a pilot study with the three largest telcos in Spain uh, to model mobility. So they actually had very accurate extrapolations of the mobility of the entire population. Of course, mobility is very important in the context of an infectious disease that is transmitted from, from human to human because it doesn't become a pandemic if we don't move, right? And that's why we've been confined for so many months. The second area is developing what is called computational epidemiological models. So models that would enable us to predict the number of COVID-19 cases in the future, depending on, on the pandemic situation, but also on potential interventions that could be applied. We've developed three different kinds of models, including a deep learning based model. And we actually developed that model in the context of the XPRIZE pandemic response challenge competition, which we actually won. So that model uh, was very accurate in predicting the COVID-19 cases in 236 countries and regions in the world. But more importantly, the government has relied on it and has used it um, since we finished it in December of 2021. 
We've also built predictive models using also uh, deep neural networks of hospital occupancy and intensive care occupancy, and also a model of the prevalence of the disease, which is very useful, particularly in, um, in developing economies where you might not have enough tests to really figure out how many people are really infected. And last but not least, well, actually, we've done two more things. We've launched a very large scale citizen survey called COVID-19 Impact Survey. It has over 720,000 answers, so it's, it's very big. And it's enabled us to understand week after week what is the impact of the pandemic on people's lives. This is very important because people haven't really had a voice during this pandemic. A lot of things have happened to us but we haven't had a lot of um, mechanisms to really express how the pandemic was impacting each of us. And this mm -hmm. citizen survey has been a tool. I finally, we have <laughs> built what I call an artificial politician, an AI-based <laughs> system that um, for, a, a, for a, a, any country and given any pandemic situation, um, given a certain cost, of different measures, it would find the optimal combination of measures that will have the best trade-off between the cost of the measures and the number of COVID-19 cases that you would uh, <laughs> have as a result of applying those measures. Ah, funny. I'm sure that it's, uh, it was very popular among uh, real politicians. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, what I've learned is that I think people genuinely want to do a good job and they genuinely want to make good decisions. So. I think once the trust is developed and there is a certain understanding of how the, the technology works and the tools work, I have found a really genuine interest in, in finding, um, in leveraging technology to support their decisions. It's been very stressful for everyone. I have not wanted to be in the shoes of politicians during this pandemic. I mean, it's yeah. been very, very difficult to make these really hard decisions, right? So. You know, even if I call it the artificial politician, they, they haven't seen themselves threatened by it because in reality, it's a tool to support people, not really to replace people. Yeah, and I completely agree with you. There was so much uh, uncertainty and um, <laughs> assumptions that had to be made. I was working both here in Israel um, with the leading epidemiologists here, and they had to simply uh, make decisions based on a huge lack of information, as well as uh, in Massachusetts. Um, and, and when we had some results, uh, immediately um, the, the staff of the governor uh, approached us and they wanted to see it. So everybody, uh, I completely agree, they, they are uh, in it uh, in order to help the population. But yeah, we would not envy them in these times. Um, actually, which brings me to another question I wanted to ask uh, uh, you, you, um, insurance uh, companies, specifically in times of crisis, either COVID or weather disasters. I know that you have been doing some project in this uh, field. Um, can they use AI in order to survive? Will they collapse when uh, some drastic uh, change happen? Because insurance companies are a huge player in, 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 in the you know, economic system. So, um, can you Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I, I see that the insurance companies have really struggled to predict these big climate change events which have taken place. I mean, you, you could just look at the evidence. Um, I think AI can surely help them. I don't, I can't tell with any degree of certainty whether or, or to what extent they already use uh, the best AI methodologies available. But you can see that the insurance companies are really struggling or have really struggled in recent years. You can see that. It's very clear. It's like a big surprise when a big climate event takes place. Um, so I think I would certainly encourage insurance companies to get out there and use the best AI uh, methodologies available. Um, yep, they're not perfect, but they are better than what we have in yesterday's world of humans. Um, yeah, Catherine, are, are you raising your hand for us? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. I just wanted to add, add to that because I think um, I'm very proud of one of the initiatives that came out of the, the EU's climate kick when I was there is uh, the OASIS uh, tool, which is a suite of tools and services that support catastrophic modeling and risk and analytics to help oh. understand and manage 
um, the climate related risks and to build the resilience. And this is what I am speaking about in terms of that fragmented solution space, because it, it is there's a, a convenient capacity around technology. We've seen it with politicians. We've seen it with other actors. Um, it, it sort of neutralizes the dialogue, even though it's creating other issues to discuss. But tools like this and these types of platforms um, that are allowing for synergies to happen, not only at the policy level, but also at that innovation level. Um, and so Oasis started as just this data agglomeration, basically, but it's really become one of the leading European providers of data, tools, software, services, and models. And it's um, some of it's open, you know, the, there are different gateways into it. Um, so I think this type of approach, the way that we're doing innovation is just as important as the, the technical innovations themselves. And actually I find AI actually helps us to um, do some of that convening capacity as well. By the way, okay. Catherine said about data, and if I think AI is a, its condition is to have as much data as possible. In many areas, you, you don't have data, so you have to create data. So this is a big issue. That's absolutely true, and that's what we found with the UN Dialogue Task Force papers: is that the tools and measurements that we've created, you know, through our Western um, eyes and institutions, cannot capture anything really um, in. The, the least developed economies uh, when it came to assessing risk. So we had sort of to, to develop new approaches. And this is also where uh, different forms of, of information can be converted into data. So that tokenization capacity that we have with, MR, you know, we talk about NRV for, you know, infrastructure, energy and everything, but we've actually seen it by using um, the finance element. So the microfinancing institutions um, uh, and NGOs that are on the ground, we're now being able to connect those and we can aggregate those and use the, the basic uh, data and models there to talk about, um, uh, to, to actually create data that's usable in terms of risks and, um, and climate and uh, in investments as well. And that's actually a model I built up for the Bank of International Settlement for a digital green bond, instead of focusing on the big energy infrastructure projects, which are the usual suspects, I talk about how we can actually start connecting with these, this type of legacy um, type of uh, community projects and bring in at data that wasn't really available. And the other thing that AI can do is actually use that within our databases and say, okay, let's clean and sweep out the basement here. Right. Let's organize this because that storage of data is what's taking up a lot of the energy um, that we're talking about. So if we can use and leverage that AI, I think there was an MIT study on this that said, let's let's use it to actually then uh, create some channels and some storage capacity that is much more efficient. So I just add those two cents in there. OK. Yeah, great. Uh, Alex, we just heard Catherine's view on this topic. Amir uh, focuses on uh, the use of AI for management. Uh, you, I think that uh, his uh, message can be summarized as just use it, uh, <laughs> right? No, for specific financial yeah. uh, and, and, goals, right, and, yeah. And, and Nuria, I think, is the master of data, being, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you didn't mention your work in Telefonica and Vodafone and, um, you know, working in telecos, uh, you have you have so much uh, high granularity data, but I wanted to ask you uh, uh, regarding a different angle. You mentioned, I think, uh, the use of uh, uh, you mentioned the industrial processes, uh, and this is something that uh, that we haven't touched um, in in any of of, of these uh, previous discussions. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit uh, on this? How can AI, uh, in your view? Uh, be used in order to redesign um, industrial processes in a way that is uh, more climate friendly? Alex? Uh, me? Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah, I did uh, okay. Um, I think that, uh, you know, as I already mentioned, um, there is a large variety of industrial processes which are uh, inefficient, um, you know, mm -hmm. because 
when they were originally envisioned, uh, the issue of climate change was not particularly important and energy was uh, readily available. And uh, so people didn't really bother to increase the coefficient, uh, you know, kind of e efficiency. Uh, but uh, I, I see many, many areas uh, where it can be done. And moreover, given the say amount of food uh, which goes to waste uh, even before it reaches the table and uh, a similar amount which goes to waste after reaching the table, I can envision for, and this is just an example which jumps to mind. One can em em envision, you know, improvements in say logistics by itself, uh, 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 augmented by better, uh, you know, the decision-making process by way of scheduling and the things of routing and so on, which are so complex that they do require artificial intelligence and it can go on and on. So that's just one example. The one example which you're working on with uh, changing the ration for cows, for example. It's another interesting example. Uh, as I already mentioned, I, I think that it is quite interesting to figure out how to better produce cement. And again, that can be uh, augmented a lot uh, with artificial intelligence, designing uh, efficient uh, road network and traffic control systems. Again, uh, can be quite uh, uh, quite useful, you know, ships, you know, jump to mind because, you know, they frequently are being used as storages these days and that's sort of also inefficient, et cetera, et cetera. So if we really want to sort of do small but significant things, which kind of can be done today, so to speak, um, I can imagine we can at least, you know, um, arrest, if not uh, start declining the amount of energy which is being used per unit of production. And then, you know, if we are good enough and can replace some of this energy uh, with, uh, you know, some better kind of greener energy, that would be an additional boon. One thing which is interesting to mention is that just the other day I was talking to a company, which obviously I cannot go into specific details, but anyway, so they wanted to do some, uh, you know, relatively small uh, thermonuclear devices. And this is something which, uh, you know, my first job at MIT when I just came to America was to work at uh, Lincoln Labs and, uh, you know, working on Alcator, which was a huge device, well, huge by the standards of that time uh, at MIT. And now these people wanted to build a very small one and they had sort of good ideas. It was interesting to go down the memory lane and open other books, which I wrote uh, 30 years ago and show them the pinches and stuff. But anyway, but the interesting point, the reason why I'm mentioning it here is not because I want to become nostalgic, but rather because there was a very interesting message, which I didn't expect at all, because they said, we will do this, we will do that. And I'm not judging whether they will succeed, but say they will succeed and produce a coefficient of 10, you know, producing 10 times more energy than going into the device, which has been a holy grail for 60 years, 70 yeah. years, and never have been achieved, but fine. Yeah. But they said, still, it will take decades, literally decades before these sources of energy become prevalent. And I looked after that, I was inspired to look at other sort of evolution of how energy is being used. And it takes literally decades, regardless of how much there is government support, uh, super government support, for example, for re uh, renewables to become a substantial. And by substantial, I only mean, say, 5 10% of the overall yeah energy sort of production. And so we need to be cognizant of the fact that regardless of how efficient our sources of energy are going to be in the near future, it would still take decades to kind of completely rebuild the energy uh, so, substructure which supports the economy. And because of that, things which are not necessarily purely technological, but more towards efficiency yeah. are, are very, very important. So and if management you... and optimization, exactly. Exactly. 
I completely agree. So what you're saying yeah. is uh, scientifically we are on our way to a revolution assisted by AI and disruption in the way we produce and manage energy. But since it takes so long to fulfill it, we would have to resort to uh, other uh, in interim solutions in order to make sure we don't run into troubles. Uh, great. This is, I think,